Well, hello, my good friends, and welcome to, um, this will be our uh, last Bible study in 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 16 today, the uh, last chapter of that book. Um, there is some interesting uh, material uh, for us to kind of examine in this book, but basically it's uh, Paul kind of signing off to uh, the Corinthians that he's writing this letter to and letting them know that he is planning to leave Ephesus soon and uh, come to visit them. And he has some special instructions uh, for them that we will uh, talk about when we get into the text. I don't have a lot of uh, preliminary material to share with you <laughs> in this session. So let me just get to um, kind of my standard <laughs> advertising for um, some of the materials that are available to you on the book of 1 Corinthians and a little bit of background stuff. Uh, I've written a couple of books that uh, have application to this Bible study. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, I've written a book called Yeshua. He will be called a Nazarene, which is basically a history of the Second Temple era when all this... Um, uh, the events of uh, First and Second Corinthians took place, and then I've written a commentary on uh, both First and Second uh, Corinthians. <laughs> My books are available uh, on Amazon. That's the best place to uh, get them. And I understand that some of them are uh, available at Barnes and Noble. Uh, also, the uh, English text for this uh, Bible study we have been using all along is the Tree of Life. Uh, version, which is a uh, Messianic Jewish um, uh, translation of the Bible using uh, a lot of uh, Hebrew names and uh, terminology that would be familiar to Jewish people that is not so familiar to uh, Gentiles. So we've had to do a little bit of kind of explanation uh, along the way. Not sure if we will uh, use this uh, translation of the Bible uh, or not when we uh, jump into 2 Corinthians, but we'll see. Uh, we've also looked at the uh, Acts chronology, uh, the fact that um, the Corinthian church was founded during uh, the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. Silas was his main traveling companion. The dates that are assigned to that are 52 and 53 um, uh, AD, or Common Era, then we've also pointed out the uh, third missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, where uh, he came uh, and spent a lot of time in Ephesus, and it was in Ephesus that he uh, wrote 1 Corinthians, and also ministered to the Corinthians kind of, you know, across the Aegean Sea there, uh, kind of back and forth with uh, letters and <laughs> some additional visits, uh, I guess, are indicated in the uh, text. Uh, first and second Corinthians were written in kind of pl close proximity to each other. First Corinthians written in Ephesus while Paul was doing ministry there. And then second Corinthians, probably from somewhere in Macedonia when he was on the way to uh, to visit there. Uh, then I also want to point out, um, for reasons that I'll make clear a little bit later, that 60 to 61 was uh, Paul's journey to Rome, where uh, he had been arrested in Jerusalem, uh, had uh, stood trial before the Sanhedrin and also before the uh, Roman and, uh, I was going to say Jewish governors, but the, uh, uh, I, I guess the uh, Herods were as close to uh, Jewish as the people of that day could hope for. Uh, and then uh, during those trials, <clears throat> Paul, as a Roman citizen, appealed to uh, Caesar, and uh, every Roman citizen had the right of appeal, um, and especially in cases of uh, where capital punishment was uh, requested and might have been appropriate for the crimes, um, every citizen could take his case before Caesar. And I think 62 is the... Um, uh, the date of uh, uh, of Paul's first uh, interview or hearing by uh, Nero, who was the uh, Roman emperor at the time. And although the uh, Bible doesn't tell us 
about that hearing or that trial uh, or about the outcome, uh, church history tells us that uh, Paul was declared innocent by uh, Caesar, by Nero, and uh, was turned loose. And uh, after that time, he wrote uh, quite a few of the um, uh, books of the New Testament. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and uh, Philemon are called the, the uh, prison epistles that Paul wrote when he was in prison in Rome. Then uh, Acts is, um, I think, usually given a, a date about this time. Acts was written by Luke, who was a traveling companion of uh, Paul. And then Hebrews uh, written, uh, according to the book of Hebrews, uh, towards the end of that book, it indicates that it was written from uh, Italy, so probably during Paul's first imprisonment. Then history tells us that Paul continued some further missionary journeys, and then he went back to Rome a second time, also accused of crimes, and that was between 67 and 68, uh, Paul's imprisonment in Rome, and it is believed that he wrote First and Second Timothy and the book of Titus while he was in his second imprisonment. And then he was martyred in uh, Rome in uh, 68, uh, I believe. And the reason I'm pointing out these dates to you is that the source of persecution for the uh, Jewish people and uh, for the sect of the Nazarenes or the Christians among them uh, changed in the year 64 AD, or Common Era. 64 was when uh, Rome burned, and uh, I think uh, many, if not most, scholars believe that Nero himself was responsible for that. He had envisioned a uh, new city of Rome uh, being built, a new and more modern uh, uh, city of Rome, and he hoped that it would be called Neroopolis or something like that. And the only way he could figure to do that, he, he, di he didn't think that uh, he could go through legal means and, you know, kind of tear the old city apart and build a new city. So he arranged for the uh, old city of Rome to be uh, to be burned. And I guess many, if not most of the buildings uh, there were of wooden construction. So uh, it just went up like a torch. And uh, after that, I guess there was some suspicion that uh, Paul, uh, that uh, Nero may have been responsible for that fire. And so he decided to use uh, the uh, Christians as scapegoats and blame them for the uh, fire of Rome. And that's when uh, Christians began to be uh, tormented by the Romans. Up until that time, all of the uh, persecution had come from Pharisaic and Sadducean sources. It was the Jews persecuting the Christians, uh, but after 64, it was the Romans who began to uh, persecute the Christians and the Jews. And uh, of course, the uh, Sadducees and Pharisees on the one hand and the Nazarenes and Essenes on the other hand uh, never got along very well, uh, but the source of persecutions for the Christians uh, changed then. So we may want to mention that uh, a little bit uh, later uh, in the uh, Bible study. Uh, here. So those are some important dates. Uh, this is the a map of the uh, second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, where he founded the church at Corinth, where uh, it was located down here in a uh, province called Achaia. Uh, this is kind of uh, Greece proper, and then up in the north is Macedonia. The, the uh, yellow uh, uh, indications on the map here are uh, Macedonia. And then uh, we have the third missionary journey where uh, Paul came across uh, country and visited the uh, churches in uh, southern Galatia that he had founded with Barnabas on the uh, first missionary journey. And it seems like this was a regular stop because he visited these churches on the second missionary journey, too. On the third missionary journey, he went along the same route. And uh, one of the things I wanted to point out today uh, since Timothy will be uh, mentioned uh, in our text for today, it was in, uh, uh, I think, Lystra or Derby, one of those uh, uh, places where Paul encountered Timothy, uh, who had a Jewish mother and grandmother, and then a Gentile uh, father. And apparently the uh, Gentile father had made the decision uh, when Timothy was born not to have him uh, circumcised. 
But uh, uh, Paul saw leadership potential in Timothy and wanted him to be a part of uh, his traveling band and um, uh, requested of uh, Timothy that he be circumcised. And I don't, I don't know how forceful he was in that uh, suggestion. Uh, it may have been in the form of an order. But the reason uh, Paul wanted to have Timothy circumcised is not because he believed that circumcision was necessary for uh, male Christians to have, who were, uh, in reality, uh, belonging to a sect of Judaism, uh, but it was for the benefit of the the uh, people along the way on that third missionary journey, who would encounter Timothy and you know would want to, uh, you know, may have known his background that he had a Gentile dad. And kind of would have been offended, or he, uh, Timothy might have lost credibility with them if he had not been circumcised. So just because of the circumstances, Paul uh, encouraged Timothy to be circumcised, and he was. And then uh, Timothy was his traveling companion. And then when they came to Ephesus here, Paul spent a lot of time there, uh, as I mentioned before, um, and not only ministering to the Ephesians, but also to the Corinthians kind of long distance and making a visit or two. Uh, along the way. This is the breakdown of the various letters and visits that Paul uh, made, and uh, so we have we have gone over those before, and I don't think it'll be helpful to uh, do that today. This is the same chart with all the Bible verses uh, printed out. So let's go ahead and jump into our text uh, for today, and we will uh, be reading 1 Corinthians 16, beginning at the uh, first verse, again, the last uh, chapter. Uh, in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. Now concerning the collection for the Kedoshim. Kedoshim is a, a Hebrew word. Uh, kadosh means uh, holy. So the Kedoshim, the plural of that, would be a reference to the holy ones. And uh, in uh, most Messianic translations, uh, Kedoshim is the uh, Hebrew word that replaces saints in, in our English translations. And uh, saints is a word that does have some baggage for uh, Jewish people, just because of the ill treatment that they have received at the hands of the saints, the Christian saints, uh, through the centuries. So uh, it's a good Hebrew word for you to know. Uh, one of the uh, worship expressions in the uh, Old Testament uh, has to do with the word kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzavaot. Milo kul ha'aretz kavodo. And then there's a New Testament expression of it. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Three times kadosh. Three times holy. Um, uh, uh, Adonai Elohim tzavaot. Uh, asher haya ve'chove ve'avo. And that means uh, the holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts or the Lord God Almighty. Um, who was and is and is to come. And then the followers of the uh, triune God are referred to as the Kodashim, the holy ones. And they are holy because through faith they've been born again. The Holy Spirit lives in them and gradually transforms them into holy people. So the subject matter here uh, is concerning the collection for the Kodashim. Now, in other um, contexts of the New Testament, uh, this collection is something that Paul was constantly involved in. From uh, the very from very early on uh, after his conversion, he had a heart for the uh, saints who were suffering uh, due to poverty, due to persecution. Uh, who knows or really knows uh, for what reasons? Um, uh, and who really knows what Paul's motives were? Um, for having this uh, compassion for the suffering saints and wanting to do something for them. So he was constantly taking up collections. And this would be probably uh, financial offerings, but maybe some goods and, um, you know, uh, material objects and things like that. But in, in all probability, it was a kind of a cash collection. And it seemed like everywhere Paul traveled, uh, he was traveling with this uh, probably pretty large uh, sum of money. So he kind of made himself a target for thieves and robbers and, and so forth. But um, uh, now at the end of 1 Corinthians, he wants to uh, 
include the Corinthians in his collections for the saints. Now, this may be a collection for the saints in general, but uh, like I say, from the other context that we have in the New Testament, the collection seems to be almost always uh, for the benefit of the saints, the Kedoshim, who lived in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. And it seems like uh, they um, always had kind of a special need. And uh, it's kind of a curiosity among interpreters of the Bible, uh, what, what it was that caused that need. And uh, I think this is a good place for us to discuss some of the suggestions that are made, uh, why the... Uh, why the saints in Jerusalem were suffering more and more were more in need of a collection to be taken up for them uh, than the saints in uh, other places. So the, the three suggestions that I have come across, and I don't think the Bible tells us whether these are legitimate or not, these are suggestions, and in a way they make sense. The most popular suggestion that I have come across is that the poverty of the Jerusalem of saints was caused by their embrace very early on, uh, like right after the first Christian a day of Pentecost, uh, to live in uh, commune, uh, in community uh, with each other. And uh, we have story after story in the uh, early uh, days of the uh, Acts of the Apostles of the Christians uh, selling property, selling homes, selling their goods, and uh, bringing the uh, profits from those sales uh, to the apostles to be distributed among the, uh, the members of the uh, congregation there in Jerusalem as anyone had need. Uh, so they, um, uh, they lived in commune. Now, one thing that history tells us about communal living is it doesn't work <laughs> just because of human nature. Uh, it is not a good incentive to, um, uh, to a good work ethic. Uh, oftentimes, there will be some in the community who will say, um, you know, if I have a financial need, uh, the community is going to provide for that. So I don't really need to work that hard to uh, earn a living. Uh, somebody will take care of me. And uh, that happens in almost every situation. And it may have happened in the Jerusalem church. It may not have happened that way. And I want to talk about a few communities where uh, this has, uh, uh, where a communal living has been tried. And one of those was in the early uh, European uh, settlements uh, in the New World uh, here in America, uh, out on the uh, coast of the Atlantic. Uh, one of those first communities uh, thought that their best bet for uh, making a go of things in the new world, because they were going to have to probably supply all their needs and and uh, help each other out, you know, different people in the community would have different skills and abilities. So they formed a uh, kind of a commune uh, there. And uh, sure enough, uh, true to uh, human nature, uh, there were some uh, lazy sluggards in that group who kind of refused to do manual labor and didn't get out there and work the fields and grow the crops. And so they learned early on that uh, communal living was not going to work for them. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, they switched to a model that valued private property and personal income and things like that <clears throat> and kind of learned the lesson. Um, another place where uh, communal living was um, uh, was in force was among the Essenes, particularly uh, those located in Qumran, uh, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and, and probably where they were written uh, also. Qumran is down along the shores of the uh, Dead Sea in kind of an isolated uh, area. And so the model for uh, existence there was communal living. Um, when someone entered the uh, uh, the group at Qumran, um, they were required to uh, give over all their property and all their financial resources, and it would be distributed among the members of the uh, of the group of the Yahad, uh, they called it, um, and uh, you know, given to uh, whoever had need. And there's no indication that it didn't work there. Uh, for, uh, you know, probably a period of uh, 150, almost 200 years, 
uh, before that uh, community was destroyed by the Romans. So it worked for an extended uh, period of time. And since the um, Christian church, the early Christian church, consisted of uh, Nazarenes and Essenes, uh, that the success of that model at Qumran may have been one of the reasons for uh, communal living to be um, uh, instituted uh, in the early days of the uh, church. We even have the story in Acts chapter 5 of Ananias and Sapphira, who were members of the Jerusalem church, and they sold uh, a piece of property or a home that belonged to them. And uh, they agreed beforehand that they would keep part of the uh, profits and uh, bring what they considered an appropriate uh, portion to the uh, apostles for distribution among the saints in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, the problem was they misrepresented themselves and they did not indicate that they had held back some. So they represented the uh, contribution that they were making to the community as being the entire prophets. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit identified them as frauds and uh, they were confronted about that. Um, in fact, uh, Peter told uh, both of them, Ananias and Sapphira, that the property was theirs before they sold it, and if they had wanted to keep all the uh, profits from it, they were free to do so. It was rightfully theirs. Uh, the problem was that they misrepresented themselves. So there was, a, again, human nature enters the uh, picture here, and oftentimes uh, there's a breakdown uh, in the effectiveness of, uh, of communal living. The other example I want to give to you of that is in the early settlements uh, in the uh, Zionist uh, movement, where uh, Jews from all over the world, uh, mainly Europe, I think, uh, settled in uh, in what was then called Palestine, which is now called the, the modern uh, state of Israel. And they um, uh, established kibbutzes. Uh, which is uh, a commune arrangement. And I think the reason for this uh, is uh, probably uh, very similar to the uh, the real motive uh, of the uh, early church in Jerusalem. And that was uh, because they were going to need mutual support and they were going to need the uh, skills and labors of uh, all the people involved to be successful. Uh, just, uh, just because of the uh, circumstances of establishing a brand new community, uh, they felt like they needed to uh, they needed that mutual support of a uh, of a commune. And so I think in both cases that what the, that's what they did. I think there are still some uh, kibbutzim that are operating in the modern state of Israel, but for the most part, um, uh, an, an economic, a uh, system that does value uh, private property and individual uh, uh, individual property and and uh, uh, what a person gets to keep his own money and invest it where wherever he wants to uh, is the model that has made the modern state of Israel a uh, success. So, for those who think that this uh, collection was being taken up by the Apostle Paul and his traveling companions for the church in Jerusalem, uh, for those who, who believe it was because of a failure of the communal system in Jerusalem, there's no evidence for that. And it's usually, uh, I think that interpretation is usually based on the motive that, um, um, uh, 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 what, um, free market capitalists want <laughs> communalism to fail every time it starts. So although there's no indication of in, in the Bible that uh, the communal system in Jerusalem failed, um, and, uh, Bible interpreters who are free market capitalists like to use this as an example that uh, if it doesn't say that the communal arrangement in Jerusalem failed, it hints at it or it suggests it uh, here. So, you know, I I don't know how much this interpretation is based on like an actual study of the historical circumstances or how much of it is a uh, prejudice uh, against uh, communal living. I do think it's important to point out, though, that uh, the communal, as we learn from uh, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, the communal living that was done in Jerusalem and uh, Qumran as well, 
was not mandated by the government. Uh, it was uh, totally voluntary. Nobody had to join the uh, commune, commune at uh, Jerusalem. And according to Peter's words, uh, nobody in the early church had to participate in the communal living uh, there in Jerusalem, that they were allowed to keep their private property if they wanted to do that, still be a part of the church, but just not a part of the uh, of the uh, commune. So um, um, I think uh, government mandated communism uh, is a um, uh, is consistently a failure. Uh, very prosperous nations are brought to their knees because of uh, communism. And uh, I know uh, uh, my country, America, has uh, for generations fought against communism wherever it appears on the scene and uh, tried to preserve freedom and liberty and capitalism in all the places where we have fought wars. And now uh, I'm giving this Bible study in the year uh, 2022, and uh, uh, the government, uh, the administration that is in office now is uh, very oriented around uh, uh, communism and government control of uh, uh, the economy and uh, so forth. So, you know, my question is, who's going to come to the rescue of America uh, if, if America bends the knee to, uh, to communism? So um, at... Uh, uh, communal living is probably uh, an, uh, an effective uh, way of initiating new communities and starting up new economies. And uh, I think the, uh, the Essenes at Qumran had a uh, very good experience with it. They were quite holy. They were quite devoted to uh, sanctification and so tried to overcome the, uh, the flaws of human nature that uh, usually bring about the uh, destruction of that. So that's one suggestion that the collection was necessary because the communal living in Jerusalem was failing. And uh, I don't know that there's any evidence for that, but it is a possibility. Uh, secondly, uh, because uh, Jerusalem was the center, kind of the epicenter, I guess we would call it, of persecution at the hands of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the book of Acts is uh, full of uh, episodes of persecution uh, brought on by the uh, Herods, by the Sanhedrin, by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, and anybody who disagreed with the uh, Nazarenes and the Essenes and their proclamation of the gospel, particularly the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which pretty much proved that he was who he claimed to be, the Son of God and the Savior of all mankind. So up until 64 AD, it was the Jews in Jerusalem who greatly outnumbered uh, the Christians uh, there, um, who uh, were just uh, quite vicious and uh, hostile in their persecution of the uh, the early uh, Christian church. Then in 64, the tables uh, turned. Uh, Nero uh, made the uh, Christians throughout the Roman Empire kind of a scapegoat for everything that was wrong with Rome uh, to try to kind of get the spotlight off of himself. And so the Romans began to uh, persecute the Christians. And remember, in the first century, the only difference between the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Nazarenes and the Essenes uh, was the fact that they were separate and distinct sects of Judaism that disagreed with each other. And uh, that's kind of the explanation for the persecutions that took place was the uh, theological uh, differences uh, between those two groups. But from a Roman perspective, they were all just Jews. So Christians, so Christian Jews and uh, uh, what Pharisaic and Sadducee uh, Jews uh, all fell uh, under the uh, persecuting hand of, of Rome. So the uh, uh, famine and so forth may have been caused by persecution. And I mean, one of the ways that, uh, of course, one of the ways that persecution can take place is you arrest the Christians and bring them to trial, and you put some of them to death, and you put some of them in jail. So that can be one form of persecution. Another form of persecution, particularly in a large city like Jerusalem that was controlled by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, was you refused to do business with anybody who was a follower of Jesus. So if a Christian had a uh, business in town, maybe he's a shoemaker or um 
um, you know, I don't know, a, a, a grocery store um, uh, owner. You just didn't buy your groceries from them. And, you know, you didn't you didn't do business with the Christians. And so they lost all their business and they became impoverished. So that's one way um, uh, that the collection could be necessary because of boycotts and and just, uh, uh, I guess, in a form, in a way, it would be sanctions placed up, upon the Christians by the other Jews. So that's a possibility. Uh, the other thing is the frequency of drought and famine in the Holy Land, in the Promised Land. Uh, and uh, wow, that happens throughout Scripture. Uh, notably, in the days of Elijah, it didn't rain for three years in Israel. And it was a form of God's judgment on the evil that was taking place in the uh, northern kingdom. But these uh, these uh, uh, periods of drought and famine uh, just happen all the time. <clears throat> I've been to Israel enough times, particularly in the winter months, uh, to know that um, uh, the winter months are the uh, rainy season in Israel. And if it doesn't rain a lot, in uh, the winter months of December and January and February and stuff like that. If it doesn't rain a lot, then the next year is going to be tough and, and it can be hard on uh, agriculture there. Uh, there is so little water available in the uh, promised land. And uh, so they really depend on the rainfall. And if it doesn't come, particularly if it doesn't come for an extended period of time, uh, uh, everybody uh, suffers in Israel. So uh, in the winter months, when it rains in Israel, everybody celebrates. And uh, some of the tourists don't like it because, it, you know, it kind of rains on their parade. Uh, but uh, so it may be just kind of a natural thing, um, a drought and famine, either caused by natural circumstances or by a judgment of God. But whatever the reason, it seems like the saints in Jerusalem were always in need of a collection. And Paul was always taking one up. And now he's writing to the Corinthians to, in, to include them in the collection that he was headed their way, and he wanted to uh, uh, have them um, uh, have some resources uh, prepared for him uh, when he uh, got there. Now, one other thing about this verse, uh, Paul uses the expression, the phrase, now concerning the something. Uh, in this case, it's the collection for the Kodashim. But that is how he introduces <clears throat> each one of the problem areas going on at Corinth that he had gotten wind of. And a little bit later in this chapter, we'll see how he learned uh, about these things. Um, so I guess what I'm suggesting is that... Um, contributions for the poor and needy, particularly among the saints may have been one of the issues that the Corinthians were worried about and concerned about and were writing to Paul, maybe asking him if it was uh, appropriate for them to be, like to have a benevolence fund and to take care of the poor and things like that. That, that may seem like a kind of a, um, a silly question to ask because you almost certainly know uh that Paul's answer is going to be that's a that's a good thing to do. But this is a specific uh, collection that he's talking to them about. So whether they were aware of the value of this uh, collection and Paul's desire that they participate in it and wrote to him about it, or he's just writing to them about it to prepare them for his coming visit. <clears throat> uh, it is it, it this collection. Uh, plays uh, is kind of a major topic in this chapter. So, concerning the collection for the Kedoshim, as I directed Messiah's communities, in other words, the Christian churches in Galatia, where he was always visiting those uh, four churches in Galatia, uh, you do likewise. So, uh, basically, Paul is saying, I've come from Galatia, and I collected money from them, and the next time I see them, I'm going to collect more money from from them, and it's going to be for the saints in uh, in Jerusalem. So uh, he is wanting to include the uh, Corinthian congregation in his collection for the saints. And here's here's the way he wants this to be done. He says, on the first day of the week, 
Uh, let each of you set aside something, saving up whatever is gained, so no collections take place when I come. So basically, Paul is saying, when I get there, I don't want you to have big fundraisers when I get there. Uh, I want this to be done beforehand. Um, I'm, you know, giving you what? Approval, encouragement uh, to take a, up a collection for the saints. But I don't want to just have, the, you know, these one time big events. I want you to be doing this all the time. And, uh, you know, not only taking care of the saints in Jerusalem, but uh, in in your community and neighboring communities around the world, wherever you take mission trips. Uh, I, I, I want uh, collections for the poor and needy to be a regular part of your uh, of your giving on a weekly uh, basis. Now, some of the commentaries that I read on this said that this is one of the indications that the church worshiped on Sunday mornings. And you may be surprised to um, uh, hear me say that, that this is just, that this is an indication of that, when I think most Christians assume that the church always worshiped on Sunday mornings, um, shortly after sunrise uh, on Sunday mornings, because that is the time that the tomb of Yeshua, the tomb of Jesus, was found empty, uh, which was kind of an evidence of his a resurrection, and so that was the time, the, uh, that was the day of the week, the first day of the week, Sunday, uh, shortly after sunrise, when the tomb was found empty, so that's when we get together on Sundays and celebrate the, uh, the resurrection of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, but it may not be that, it may not be that. One of the things I need to address with, with respect to the day of worship uh, is the fact that uh, it is not the case that in the Old Testament, the, the preferred day of worship, in fact, the, the day that God insisted on, was Saturday. But then after the time of Jesus, the Sabbath day was changed to Sunday. It was not. The Sabbath day and a Sunday um, uh, worship are two completely different things. Uh, the Sabbath day from the Old Testament that takes place on Saturday is a day of rest. Um, it, it's talked about in the Ten Commandments. It's talked about throughout the Old Testament. It was the one day of a week that God gave to man as a blessing and a benefit to him so that he got to rest from his uh, labors and spend time with his family and spend time in prayer and, and uh, so forth, do those important things and not be distracted uh, by his uh, daily labor. So that was the Sabbath day, and it never changed. Uh, it never changed to Sunday. The, you know, uh, Saturday is always the uh, uh, the Sabbath day, the day of, of rest. Sunday is the celebration of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, But what may surprise you is that there is some historical evidence that the Sunday worship did not take place on Sunday morning after the sun rose. Um, certainly over time it developed into that, but originally that may not have been the uh, practice. Now in uh, some of the Messianic Jewish uh, versions that we look at, uh, it does not, the text does not say the first day of the week, but it says on Motzi Shabbat. Motzi is a Hebrew word that means the going out of the Sabbath day. And uh, the Greek text is unequivocal. <clears throat> it says, kata, according to Mion, the first uh, Sabbatu of the, of the seven days of a week. So this is definitely a reference to Sunday. But here's the question I'll ask you. According to the biblical paradigm, when, do, at, like at what time of day does Sunday begin? And most of you who, uh, you know, have read uh, the Old and New Testaments know that um, the division between Saturday and Sunday takes place on Saturday evening at sunset. And as soon as the sun sets on Saturday evening, Sunday has begun. So the hours of darkness come before the hours of uh, daylight. 
So, which brings us to Motsi Shabbat. Uh, in the early Christian church, particularly in uh, Jerusalem, but uh, um, uh, in any community where there was a synagogue, uh, we've already talked about the fact that the pattern of the Apostle Paul was when he would come to a uh, new city on one of his mission trips, um, he would go to the, the first place he would go was to the synagogue. And these were Pharisee and Sadducee synagogues. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they weren't Messianic synagogues. Messianic synagogues came later. So uh, Paul and his traveling companions would go to the synagogue and as um, uh, honored guests and visitors in the synagogue, and Paul had some academic credentials, uh, he would be invited to preach. So he would preach about Jesus, that he was the son of God, that he rose from the dead, that you can have eternal life by faith in him and so forth. And some of those synagogues would let him get away with that for a while. And some of them had a very short fuse and would kick him right out of the uh, synagogue. So Paul and his companions would normally go to the non-Messianic, non-believing in Yeshua synagogues and stay there until they got kicked out. And uh, for however long they were allowed to stay there on Saturdays, and of course the Sabbath day begins on Friday evening and ends Saturday evening. So in most local synagogues, there would be a Sabbath service on Friday evening after the sun went down. The, the Jews in the community would get together and worship. And then there would be another worship service. Sometimes there was a... Uh, probably for the larger synagogues, there would be a service on Saturday morning after the hours of, you know, darkness on Shabbat. Then after the sun rose, there would be a Saturday morning service. And for many of the synagogues, there was a Motsi Shabbat service in the evening of Saturday before Sunday had started. And uh, it was called Motsi Shabbat because it was the going out of the Sabbath. And, and it was an opportunity for Jewish people to give thanks to God for a day of rest. And you know, for all of his uh, wonderful work in their lives and their community and so forth. And uh, then once the sun went down, then they would leave because it was no longer Shabbat. So they would go to their homes and get ready to start the uh, work week. And because the uh, Christians often uh, in communities, not only initially upon starting a gospel um, mission work in a community, uh, but a lot of times the Christians would worship in the non-Messianic, non-believing uh, synagogues and, you know, witness to as many people as they could in their time there. Uh, but then uh, when the Motsi Shabbat service, the, the Saturday evening service, ended as the sun was going down, uh, the Christians would um, usually go to people's homes so, you know, like when Paul and his companions got kicked out of the synagogue in a community, they would start up house churches um, in the homes of some of the people who had come to faith in Yeshua and become believers and been born again, and the church would meet in their homes. It was not, you know, it probably took quite a bit of time in those communities to develop enough, uh, what, um, uh, to populate those house churches sufficiently to raise enough funds to build a synagogue, like a Messianic synagogue in the community. And in fact, I don't think there's any reference in the New Testament to Messianic synagogues uh, in those communities. It's always uh, the church meeting in, in people's uh, homes. So uh, what, the, uh, what the Christians would do in Jerusalem and other places as well is they would go to the non-believing, non-Messianic, Pharisaic, uh, synagogue services, and they would worship the God of the Bible. And then uh, when the sun set, they would leave the uh, non-believing, non-Messianic synagogue, and they would go to somebody's house, and they would continue their worship just among the believers, and they would celebrate Holy Communion, and they would read scripture from the New Testament as soon as they had it available uh, to them. And they would pray um, in the name of Jesus and uh, to Jesus, to the triune God and so forth. So they would have a like a follow-up service. Now, when did that follow-up service, they left the synagogue and went into somebody's home and had a worship service there. 
What day of the week was that? Well, it was Sunday. Saturday had just ended, and they went and they, they celebrated in the early hours of darkness at the beginning of Sunday. Uh, one evidence for this is in the story of uh, Paul at Troas, I believe it is, uh, where he's um, uh, meeting with them uh, on the first day of the week, and uh, it says he preaches till midnight. Now, most people picture that like as, well, they met at like 9 o'clock on Sunday morning, and he preached until midnight. So, like, he preached, like, what would that be? Like, uh, 12, like, 15 hours. Well, Paul could, you know, probably preach for a while, but that's a little bit unreasonable. So, I think what probably happened is that the preaching that took place that night, and this is where Eutychus, the young guy, was sitting in the windowsill while Paul was preaching, and he fell asleep, and he fell out the window and was taken up for dead, but uh, apparently uh, Paul went down and healed him and went on about his business and probably preached some more. So Eutychus had had a long day. He'd probably been to the synagogue, the non-believing, non-Messianic synagogue, then he went to somebody's house where uh, Paul continued to preach until midnight. So for what, maybe three or four, maybe five hours, uh, the preaching went on. So not nearly as long as the other uh, model. But all of those events after the Motsi Shabbat would have taken place on a Sabbath day. But it wasn't in the sunlight of dawn. It was in the uh, hours of darkness Um uh, as the uh, first day of the week was beginning. So, uh, just a little uh, Bible trivia on that point, I guess. Uh, on the first day of the week, maybe just after the uh, sun had set uh, on uh, Saturday evening and as Sunday was beginning when the Christians got together, that's when Paul wanted them to take up the collection. So yeah, I'll grant he could Paul could be talking about a uh, like a sunrise service on Sunday morning, but I think he's probably talking about an evening service that took place right after the uh, the synagogue service in the in the community. So what the, or the people were do was to set uh, was supposed to do was to was set something aside, saving up whatever is gained. Now that's a, a kind of an interesting uh, phrase. Um, the Yudotai, it's translated as prosper uh, here, uh, and uh, and here's how here's how I would interpret that. I think the uh, rule of thumb for Christians, although it is not man, it is mandated in the law of Moses, but it's not mandated for Christians that I'm aware of. Uh, but it is suggested and recommended uh, for Christians. Uh, to tithe, to give 10% of your income. But that's not the money that Paul wants. Paul does not want money from people's tithes. He wants something from their euodota. Euodota. It doesn't really give us the root word here. Uh, although, yes, I guess it does. I guess it does. We'll go down here. I think in parenthesis here, it's the, uh, is the, um, uh, Kind of the breakdown of this word, the U part, the the E U part uh, means good or beautiful, and then hados is the Greek word for road or travel or the way you travel. So another way of saying this would be the way of prosperity. So I think what this is saying is that um, it is a good expectation of all Christians that they would tithe, that they would give ten percent of their income on a regular basis to the ministry that takes place in the community where they are uh, living and, you know, financially supports the, the church they attend and the staff, including the pastor and secretary and whoever else is on the payroll. Uh, that is a good thing to be done with the tithe. But then there are offerings over and above that. And I think this term, uh, you adotai, or you, uh, no, I guess it would be you adotai would be the way of prosperity. So if you come into some extra money, if you've got a little bit, um, uh, if, you've, if you've got some extra money in the bank, um, 
at the end of your budget uh, period, your uh, at the end of the week or something, uh, that's a uh, a good use a good use of your over and above the tithe offerings would be to contribute to the needs of the saints in Jerusalem. So uh, that's that's the kind of money though. Paul wants this. He wants this to be a special offering. Uh, you know, don't reduce your tithe and give, uh, uh, you know, a few percentage points of your tithe to to this collection. Uh, it should be over and above. So uh, something set aside, uh, whatever is gained, uh, whatever's kind of extra. So no collections take place when I come. Like I said before, Paul doesn't want a big fundraising event. Uh, he wants this to become a regular part of their um, Motsi Shabbat activities. Then whenever I arrive, I will send whoever you approve, of, uh, whoever you approve with letters of introduction to carry the gift to Jerusalem. So Paul is going to take the money, but he's also going to ask that a representative of the congregation accompany him uh, to deliver this money to uh, Jerusalem. And the letters of introduction would be the letters that would uh, be carried by Paul or by the person they choose from Corinth to accompany him, that when they get to Jerusalem, these letters can be presented and they'll say, um, uh, hello, um, you know, uh, this, is, uh, Lu uh, this is Lucius from Corinth, and he's a member in good standing of the congregation, and he's representing the Corinthians in offering this gift to the uh, uh, to the needy uh, in Jerusalem. So he would identify him as a legitimate representative of the congregation. Uh, if it is uh, advisable for me to go also, the, uh, they will go with me. So Paul didn't care so much if he was a part of the the delivery of the collection of the Corinthians to Jerusalem. Uh, fine if it if he is a part of it, fine if he is not. So in other words, if the Corinthians appointed somebody that they uh, trusted to bring the entire collection to Jerusalem, um, they would be given introductory letters and they could go by themselves. And uh, that way Paul wouldn't have to tote this money around and, you know, be a, a bigger target for... Uh, for robbers and thieves. So that person could go by himself with these letters of introduction, and the Jerusalem saints would be glad to receive it from him. But if it worked out better uh, that uh, they travel uh, with Paul or Paul travel with them, Paul says that's fine with him too. Uh, verse 5, but I will come to you after I have passed through Macedonia, for I am passing for I'm passing through Macedonia. It doesn't mean that he was doing it at the time of writing. It just means that he was planning to do that. Uh, he's still in Ephesus writing this letter, telling them about his plans. So he's planning that when he leaves Ephesus, uh, he's going to pass through Macedonia and come down to Achaia and visit the Corinthians. He wants to hang out with them for a while. Uh, going on with his plans in verse 6, perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you can help me with my journey wherever I go. Um, the journey he's talking about is not to Jerusalem. Uh, ultimately, he's planning to get there anyway. Uh, but uh, he had he had some plans for the future. Uh, he had always wanted to go to Rome. And as of this writing to the Corinthians, he hadn't been to Rome yet. Uh, so he wanted to go to Rome, and one of the reasons that he wanted to go to Rome was because when Jesus called him to salvation and to ministry, uh, he said that he would stand before kings, and the ultimate king in those days, well, the ultimate king in those days was Jesus, but humanly speaking, it was the emperor uh, in Rome. And as we mentioned earlier, after the third missionary journey, uh, Paul is arrested in Jerusalem, and that event eventually brings him to Rome to stand trial before Caesar. But he also wanted to go to Spain. And uh, so uh, these are some places that he had on his mind. And uh, so uh, Paul says, I'd like to stay with you for a while, maybe even spend the winter with you so that you can help me on my journey. So what is Paul talking about here? He, more money, <laughs> more financial support. 
for the continuation of these uh, missionary journeys. So Paul's collections were not only for the needy of the saints in Jerusalem and other places, but they were also to fund the ministry that he and Silas, he and Barnabas, he and Timothy, he and uh, all these other people, um, they needed finances to be able to go to these places. And Paul thought maybe the Corinthians can help out there. Uh, for I do not wish to uh, see you now just in passing, for I hope to stay with you for a while, if the Lord permits. So I think what Paul is saying is, if I came to you right now, uh, I would just have to uh, kind of say hello and goodbye. And that, I, I don't want to do that. I want to stay with you for a while. Number of reasons for that. One we've already talked about. Paul hoped to uh, build some relationships and to gain some financial support for his missionary work from that congregation. Also, he has just uh, written this letter. He's finished. He's finishing up writing this letter that addresses all the problems that are going on. So he wants to visit there and um, follow up on this letter with some, you know, probably some counseling and some pastoral advice and things like that. And that's going to take some time. And he loves those folks. He just wants to spend time with them. Look, for all of its faults, um, uh, Corinth was a charismatic church. It was an awesome place uh, to um, uh, to live, to do ministry, uh, to see God at work in supernatural ways. Uh, but then in verse 8, he uh, explains another reason why he's not going to be coming right away. He says, I will stay at Ephesus until Shavuot. Shavuot is the Hebrew word that means Pentecost. So uh, after the uh, spring feasts of Passover, uh, unleavened bread, and the Feast of First Fruits, you count off 50 days, that's where the word Pentecost comes from, and then you have the summer festival of uh, Pentecost. And it was one of the times when Jewish men were supposed to show up in Jerusalem. So he, he was planning to stay in Ephesus and plan his journey to Macedonia and Greece so that he could still get to uh, Jerusalem in time for Shavuot. Um, for a great door has opened wide for me, uh, though many are in opposition. And if you want to read about this, uh, read uh, chapter 19 of the Acts of the uh, Apostles. Uh, God was working powerfully in uh, Paul's life and ministry there in Ephesus, and great things were happening. But as Paul mentions here, there was some uh, there was some opposition, and uh, eventually that opposition would grow so um, hostile that Paul would have to leave Ephesus for his own uh, safety. Um, now, if Timothy comes, see that he has nothing to fear among you, for he is doing the Lord's work just as I am. Now, in the introductory material, we talked about uh, where Timothy came from and what his family background was, and Paul has him circumcised, and he's Paul's traveling companion, and he comes to uh, Ephesus with Paul and works with him uh, there. Uh, but apparently, based on this verse, it sounds like Timothy has left Paul uh, there in Ephesus, and um, has kind of gone on ahead of, of Paul, either to kind of pave the way for Paul, or maybe Timothy has a special calling for himself, and, uh, you know, he's he's left Ephesus and maybe on the way to Corinth. So Paul writes to the Corinthians and says that uh, if Timothy comes, uh, see that he has nothing to fear among you. So he's saying to the Corinthians, I know you've never met Timothy, but he's one of my guys. So if he comes to you, treat him well. Now, I believe it is of Timothy that uh, Paul writes in one of his epistles, probably one of the epistles to Timothy, uh, don't let anyone judge you or think, um, uh, think less of you because of your youth, because of your young age. So Timothy may have been a teenager or a 20-something or, or something like that. He may have been a young guy who wouldn't have a lot of credibility in churches where uh, elders were actually old. They were older people. But uh, basically, Paul is saying, this guy has something to offer you, so treat him right. He is doing the Lord's work, just as I am. No one then should treat him with disrespect, either because of his age or, 
you know, for whatever reason, but set him on his way in shalom. And I bet you know what that word means, peace. Send him on his way in peace. Uh, what is it? Erene in uh, Greek, but shalom in Hebrew. Uh, send him on his way in peace so that he may come to me, for I'm expecting him along with the brothers. So Paul was intending to be united with Timothy, either before or after Timothy may or may not visit uh, Corinth. So Paul's kind of covering his bases here. Now about our brother Apollos. Apollos is an interesting guy um, who, for, uh, who is who first comes to prominence in the book of Acts in the city of Ephesus, where Paul is now and where he's writing this letter. And um, he is a believer, um, you know, probably born again a believer, may have been a disciple of John the Baptist. But he comes to Ephesus, and the guy's brilliant. He's well-educated, very spiritual man, but he doesn't have the full story of Yeshua. Uh, don't know if he knew about the resurrection of Yeshua. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Don't know if he knew about Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because when Paul comes to Ephesus on his third missionary journey, Apollos has already moved on to Corinth. Uh, after um, uh, some ministry at the hands of um, Priscilla and Aquila, some friends of uh, of Paul's there in Ephesus. So Apollos has moved on. Paul comes to Ephesus and he finds some disciples there, and um, he asks them if they if these disciples received the Holy Spirit when they believed. And he's talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and manifestation of spiritual gifts. And these disciples, apparently disciples of Apollos, say, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So this may have been the area of information that was lacking in Apollos. And uh, maybe it was cleared up by Priscilla and Aquila. Maybe it wasn't. Uh, but uh, anyway, Paul resolves that. He lays hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues and, I don't know, glorify God or prophesy or manifest spiritual gifts. So about our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brothers and sisters. Uh, and he's talking about fellow believers uh, here. And it probably just says brothers in the Greek text. Yes, it does. But the Tree of Life version adds sisters in there too, which isn't technically grammatically accurate, but it's not inaccurate either. So uh, uh, I urged him to come to you with the brothers, and he was quite unwilling to come now. And that makes it sound like uh, Apollos didn't like the Corinthians. Maybe they did him dirty when he was uh, there before. But um, he apparently is with, uh, Apollos is apparently with Paul uh, there in Ephesus. But it does say, Paul goes on to say, but he will come to you when he has an opportunity so his unwillingness to come is just because of other demands on his time. Uh, he doesn't hate the Corinthians, and he, he does plan to visit them at a more opportune time. Uh, verse 13, uh, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong. Uh, maybe an indication of some persecution raising in, uh, uh, raging in Corinth. Uh, maybe some false doctrine had arisen there. Not sure what the alert is for, the, uh, you know, kind of the encouragement to be strong. Hazak, hazak, nit hazak, they say in Hebrew. Uh, be strong, be of good courage. Let all you do be done in love. And here again, he kind of brings up the subject of 1 Corinthians 13, one of the spiritual gifts passages, that everything you do, including spiritual gifts, should be done in love. Now, I urge you, brothers and sisters, and we've talked about this enough times, it's just Adelphoi, brothers in the Greek, but we'll add sisters here too. You know, this is in parenthesis here, which is kind of fitting. It's, it's kind of a, a thought that has occurred to Paul. I urge you, brothers, you know the household of Stephanus, who's a member of the church at Corinth that uh, it is, that is, the household of Stephanus, is the first fruits of Achaia. Achaia is the ancient word for Greece, the province where the Corinthian church is located. 
So it may be that Stephanus was the first believer, the first convert, the first disciple that Paul made uh, when he came to uh, Corinth and established the church there. And Stephanus had a household, uh, a, a, a church that met in his uh, in his household. So there was a house, there was a house church there. And that is the pattern of the New Testament. Messianic synagogues or Christian churches as buildings uh, don't come along until uh, quite a bit later. This is still the era of persecution. Uh, you know the household of Stephanus that is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves in service to the Kedoshim. Now, one of the projects that the uh, uh, house church of Stephanus uh, took on was the collection for the saints. And uh, Paul appreciates that. It's a it's a high priority to him, too. Verse 16. Also, su to submit to people such as these, and to everyone working together and laboring. Now, this may mean that um, uh, Paul had given Stephanus uh, the, uh, what, the authority, the approval uh, to be kind of a representative for uh, raising uh, funds for the collection for the saints in Jerusalem. So he may be saying here, uh, if Stephanus gives you the word about this collection, listen to what he has to say. Uh, I rejoice, he said, at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, three guys, for they made up for your absence. Now, uh, most of the commentators say this is how Paul received the letter from the Corinthians filled with questions and um, uh, seeking Paul's pastoral advice, his apostolic advice on all these issues that were going on, uh, the sexual immorality, the um, uh, kind of misuse of spiritual gifts, um, you know, taking each other to the civil courts, uh, all the things that Paul has been talking about. Well, how, where, how did he get that letter from them? They didn't just put it in the mailbox and it showed up on Paul's doorstep. Uh, somebody brought it to him. And in all likelihood, it was these three guys, Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. Fortunatus and Achaicus may have been members of Stephanus house church, or Fortunatus and Achaius may also have had house churches, so that there was more than one house church represented in that letter that came to Paul, which he in response wrote to 1 Corinthians. For uh, when they came with that letter, they refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge such men. Now, if indeed they were the couriers of this letter, the letter's full of negative stuff, so it could have been very depressing and discouraging for Paul, but that's not how he reacted to it. Uh, they refreshed my spirit and yours. I think Paul was absolutely thrilled that the Corinthians were taking these challenges, these issues, this misbehavior that was going, taking it seriously and wanting to know how's the best way, the most God-pleasing way for them to handle it. And a person in Christian leadership loves that stuff, even if it represents to him a, a lot of coming labor and diligence and time-consuming dealing with, um, you know, relationship issues and, and human foibles and, and such. Verse 19, Messiah's communities or Christ's communities or congregations or churches, the Greek word is ekklesiai, but again, our Messianic Jewish uh, versions of the Bible will use the word congregation or communities uh, or kehilot. Some of them using, even use kehilot. The kahal is an assembly of uh, people. And actually, the Greek word ekklesia is a gathering of uh, people. It's an assembly, a congregation, a church. Church has just taken on a, uh, what, like a theological significance. But here in our uh, Hebrew New Testament, we've got ha kehilot, which is the plural of kahal, which is also an assembly uh, calling out of uh, people and so forth. So communities, uh, same kind of deal. Uh, Messianic Jewish versions of the Bible don't like to use the word church. Again, baggage for Jewish people. 
Maasai's communities in Asia greet you. Um, he's talking about Asia Minor here. It's modern day Turkey, and that's where Ephesus was located. So Paul is saying, you know, all of the uh, Christians, the, the various house churches here in Ephesus and this region in uh, Asia Minor uh, greet you. The Hebrew probably says, uh, Sha'alu Shalom Kem, but Shalom Kem. Uh, they uh, seek your peace. Um, Jewish people are always saying shalom to each other. It's kind of a greeting. So they greet you with shalom. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord. So they are still in Ephesus with Paul. On Paul's second missionary journey, after he had established the church at uh, Corinth, uh, he uh, I believe he met uh, Priscilla and Aquila there. And when he left Corinth and went to Ephesus, Paul traveled on from, he was only in Ephesus for just a very brief time, but he left Aquila and Priscilla there to continue the work of ministry in Ephesus. Well, they're still there. So uh, uh, Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord with the community that meets in their house. So Priscilla and Aquila had a uh, house church uh, there in Ephesus. So again, house churches are the model, not these community uh, buildings that hold hundreds of uh, people. Um, uh, verse 20, all the uh, brothers and sisters uh, greet you, uh, greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, now, in biblical times, the kiss on the cheek was the way of showing affection and love and respect, and uh, it was just a common greeting. Uh, nowadays, it's the handshake, and uh, some Christians uh, are uh, bold, and they'll give you a hug, too. So a handshake and a hug is the same as the uh, holy kiss in biblical times. This greeting is in my own hand, Paul's. So uh, let's see, in verse 21, does he use his own name there? Uh, verse 21, uh, yes, Kairi Paulu, the hand of Paul. Now, this gives us a little insight into the way that Paul um published his letters or caused his like the the um, uh, system that he used to uh, publish all these letters that he wrote. Uh, it seems from a lot of his letters uh, to indicate that his uh, typical thing was to give dictation and then somebody else would write down Paul's words. And of course he would check them, you know, he was the one with apostolic authority. And uh, he was the one that was uh, able to come up with the inspired text of the New Testament uh, documents that he wrote, but he would usually dictate to someone else. Now, um, fairly recently in my own studies, I have uh, learned from uh, documents from uh, the early days of the Christian church that um, most, if not all, of the books of the New Testament were first written by these Jewish guys who spoke Hebrew. The New Testament documents were written in the Hebrew language first and then were translated into Greek. And uh, I'm sure Paul knew both Hebrew and Greek, uh, but he used, I think they're called amanuensises, or um, dictation secretaries, uh, you might call it, to do his writing. And then what he would usually do is he would look at what the scribe had written, and then he would sign his name to it. So this is where he's signing his name. And he indicates to them that he's doing it. He says, this greeting is in my own hand. Paul. So he probably wrote all of verse 21, including his name, in his own handwriting. So, uh, you know, maybe his friends in uh, Corinth would recognize his uh, handwriting. But um, the, the interesting thing about this, uh, it's, uh, it's called the primacy of Hebrew in the New Testament. Uh, the, uh, the fact, the documented fact that the books of the New Testament were written first in Hebrew. The challenging part of that is uh, no one has, able to, has been able to find any New Testament documents from antiquity, antiquity written in the Hebrew language to prove that that was the case. And there are a couple of reasons for that. And let me say, first of all, one of the things that we look for when we look at ancient Hebrew texts 
if they precede, uh, like if they were the source for a Greek copy of that book, there would not be in the Hebrew texts of what are called peshers or pesherim or targumim in Aramaic. And those are translations of Hebrew terms that are transliterated into the Greek text. So in other words, in Matthew's gospel, when Jesus is born, Matthew says this was done to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. A virgin will conceive and give birth, and, uh, and uh, the, you know, the child's name will be called Emmanuel, Emmanuel. All the Greek texts add after the word Emmanuel words to the effect of, which means God with us. So when we look at ancient Hebrew texts, we look for a Hebrew text that doesn't have the pesher. It doesn't have the interpretation. It just says this was done to fulfill what was uh, uh, spoken by Isaiah the prophet. It, you know, he will be called Emmanuel. In a Hebrew New Testament text, you would not explain what Emmanuel means. It would be like saying, they will call his name Emmanuel, which means Emmanuel. That would be redundant, and you wouldn't expect to see that in a Hebrew text. So all of the Hebrew, I didn't even know these Hebrew texts existed, but I have in my possession about a dozen, uh, and these are, I mean, generations, hundreds, thousands of years of copying from, from very ancient texts. Uh Whenever I look at those texts, the first thing I look for is the Pesherim. And in most of the ones that I have in my collection, the Pesherim are there, which is an indication that it's a copy of the Greek into Hebrew again. So it went from Hebrew to Greek, then back to Hebrew, if the Hebrew contains the Pesherim. And most of the texts that I have have the Pesherim. There are two that do not. And they are called Sebastian Munster's Hebrew text. It does not have the Pesherim. And the Dutillet uh, Hebrew text of the, uh, it's not the whole New Testament. Uh, these are uh, Matthew's Gospel and some other uh, books. But I have Hebrew, I have ancient Hebrew texts of um, uh, quite a few other uh, uh, books of the, uh, the New Testament. So, um, yeah, I don't really know if this is the time to be talking about this, but this is something I'm I'm very excited about, and I may have found some medieval uh, text, Munster's text and the Dutillet text of the New Testament in Hebrew that predate the Greek and may have been the source. So these may be inspired Hebrew documents of the uh, New Testament. So I'll continue to study them and just have a lot of fun uh, doing it. And I have found in my reading of these texts so far that they uh, they really answer some kind of interesting questions that the Greek, like problems that the Greek texts uh, pose. Okay, verse 22, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. And uh, let me bring verse 22 up a little higher. The word accursed is anathema, uh, and that doesn't mean just to be like temporarily out of fellowship with God because of sin. Anathema is a declaration of eternal death. Uh, this is the uh, indication that Paul gave. It's either earlier in this book or one of the other books of the New Testament. Oh, it's in Romans, where he says, I would be willing to be accursed. I would be willing to be anathema if that position of mine would prompt the Jewish people to receive Jesus as their Savior. And most people uh, probably uh, uh, interpret that, uh, interpret Paul as saying, well, I'd be willing to take some punishment. I would be willing to be separated from the Lord temporarily. Uh, I would be willing to uh, be the victim of a plague or something like that. No, he's saying if... If I could receive eternal death, forever separated from God, and that that would bring my fellow Jews to uh, to faith, uh, I, he says I, I would be willing to do it. Now, I mean, that's an easy thing for Paul to say, because he knows, theologically, that that's not going to bring the uh, Jews 
But the fact that he would put it out there, that he would be willing to experience spiritual death, demonstrates a love for his own people, the Jews, that I cannot comprehend. I cannot comprehend in my mind taking upon myself eternal death so that somebody else could benefit by, by Jesus. I just don't love people that much, but I need to. I need to love people that much. I need to become more like Paul and less like me, actually more like Jesus and less like me. So if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be cursed. Let him be uh, the recipient of a declaration or a sentence of eternal death. Because loving the Lord Jesus and believing on him is the only way you can be saved. Now we have the term marana ta. Now, in some texts, it's written differently. Uh, in some texts, it's written maran without the A. And the second word is ata. So this version of it is marana Ta. And basically, either one of them means the Lord come. Now, in the information uh, window uh, down at the bottom of the page, it says some manuscripts say Maran Ata, which means our Lord has come. Or as it appears in the text that we're looking at, uh, it means, let me highlight it again. Uh, it means our Lord is coming. So if it's Maran Ata, it means our Lord has come. It's talking about the first advent of Yeshua. If it's saying our Lord is coming, uh, then it, it's talking about his uh, second advent. And either one of those is cool. And uh, it's hard to tell because it's the same letters. It's just where do you put the space? Um, and this is an Aramaic expression. Um, uh, even uh, biblical, even New Testament Hebrew has um, Aramaic words in it. Um, the um, uh, common expression in Hebrew now for father and mother is Abba and Emma. Uh, those are both Aramaic expressions that have just been assimilated into the Hebrew language. The Hebrew expression of that is av and im, without the final a on, on both words. But everybody loves Abba, Abba Father. Um, that's how I refer to my God and Father. Uh, I call him Abba, and it's uh, Aramaic. This is Aramaic too, but it made its way into the Hebrew, uh, which means our Lord uh, come. So this version of it is looking into the future at the second coming. The grace of the Lord Yeshua be with you. Uh, my love be with you all in Mashiach Yeshua. And that is the end of 1 Corinthians 16 and the end of the book of uh, 1 Corinthians. My intention is that the next uh, Bible study video that I make will be on 2 Corinthians. And we'll be using the same PowerPoint uh, material for that because it's really kind of just a continuation of uh, 1 Corinthians. And uh, so it's kind of the rest of the story. And uh, 2 Corinthians is a great book, has a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of follow-up on things that were written in uh, 1 Corinthians. Like, for example, in 1 Corinthians 5, I believe it is, it talks about the member of the Corinthian congregation, uh, a male who was having an inappropriate sexual rela relationship with his father's wife probably his stepmom or something like that. And uh, of course, that needed to be dealt with. And Paul's advice was that they excommunicate this guy. Well, in 2 Corinthians, we're going to find out what happened to him. Uh, and uh, it's a great story. It turns out it, it turns out well. I don't want to do too much of a spoiler alert here. But uh, so the next video I make will probably be uh, 2 Corinthians. And I think the best way to approach these books is to take them as uh, like, two two volumes of the same uh same uh story when i wrote my commentary on first and second corinthians i put both letters in uh, one book and uh, that worked out uh, really well
So let me give you the uh, New Testament blessing here. Well, let's just use the one that Paul gives us here in 1 Corinthians 16, 23. The grace of Adonai Yeshua be with you all. Call Hakadoshim uh, Kulam Kulken. So, uh, yes, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. And I hope you'll join me for 2 Corinthians.